Welcome to an hour of HealthMade Radio. HealthMade is a community for natural health seekers where we educate people about common health conditions and share extensive research on the most effective natural health treatments and promote legislation that protects our health freedoms. A core concept belief is in the innate intelligence and healing power of the body, and if properly supported spiritually, emotionally, and nutritionally, it can find its way back to health. HealthMade Radio will bring information from integrative health experts throughout the world. Check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld, and I will be your host. Today's guest is Dr. Nicola Duchamp. Dr. Nicola is a licensed naturopathic doctor trained in both the United States and her native country of Australia. Dr. Nicola started her career working with children with autism. She also developed a preconception health care program and worked with adults in areas of hormone balancing, detoxification, digestive issues, and fertility. Before long, she started seeing Lyme patients and is now recognized as a Lyme expert internationally. She has authored several books on the subject, including the best-selling The Lyme Diet, The Beginner's Guide to Lyme Disease, Lyme Disease in Australia, and Lyme Brain. She has also been a chapter contributor in two of Connie Strassen's book, Insights into Lyme Disease Treatment, 13 Lyme Literate uh, Health Care Practitioners Share Their Healing Strategies, and New Paradigms in Lyme Disease Treatment, 10 Top Doctors Reveal Healing Strategies at Work. She consults with patients around the world, blending conventional and integrative approaches to treating Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses. Uh, Dr. Nicola, it's such an honor to have you on the show today, and, and I'm really excited to chat about what, uh, what you have to say. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, why Lyme? Why did you, I mean, there's so many things that uh, a practitioner can really focus on. Why did you focus on Lyme? Well, good question. And to be honest with you, it just kind of happened. Um, I was working, as as you were saying in my bio, I was working more with uh, kids on the autism spectrum and just started seeing some of their moms as patients. And so, you know, these sort of 30-something-year-old women were like, oh, gosh, you know, I'm exhausted every day. Everything hurts. I've got headaches. And they said, you know, we used to think it was just the post-baby syndrome, but now I really think something's wrong. And so I had already got into functional medicine, like doing diagnostic testing and really trying to figure out the underlying cause of someone's health issues. And so, you know, I would work them up for heavy metal toxicity, adrenal fatigue, thyroid issues. Um, And Lyme was one of the things that I was starting to test for. And it just came up positive so many times. And then, you know, as we went through treatment, these women would would get better. So it was just one of those things that just kind of happened organically. And, uh, and before long, I was really kind of specializing predominantly in Lyme disease. And one of the issues with Lyme disease uh, is the testing component. A lot of people, they go and they just get a Western blot test, and which has, uh, tends to show a lot of false negatives in regards to Lyme. What, what kind of test would you suggest our listeners to take uh, in order to be able to screen out whether Lyme may be the issue? Yeah, well, that's a great question because it's really a challenging area. And so even kind of even worse than just getting a standard Western blot, a lot of other docs that don't know the Lyme testing will just run an ELISA as a first step. So that's just a general sort of antibody test. And we know for a fact that the ELISA is not sensitive enough. It was actually never designed to be a diagnostic test. So a lot of times people will just get an ELISA test ordered and they'll only even do the Western blot if the ELISA comes back positive. So that's even, you know, that's even worse. So even through regular labs like LabCorp and Quest, the Western blots are more limited. They only look for three bands on the IgM and their they're just methodology isn't as sophisticated. So I certainly still test for Lyme. Um, I would never go into treatment with somebody that, you know, especially if we did antibiotics, I'm sure we'll get to questions like that, that had, you know, zero signs of chronic infection on their lab work. But we recognize that with Lyme, it has to, you know, the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis backed up by lab work, you know, put together with 
history, symptoms, presentation, and then sometimes how they respond to treatment is part of the diagnostic algorithm um, because that will give us information too. So I still use Igenix, which is a specialty Lyme lab. They do a great Western blot, but for example, you know, they recognize six bands on the IgM, which is the, the, the marker of active infection. So if somebody has two out of six positive, that will reflect a positive result. Whereas on a lab core, for example, they would need two out of three positive. So they're just not looking for as much information. Um, and then sometimes we do PCR testing. There's another lab, DNA Connections, that has a urine panel that's PCR. So PCR means they're actually looking for the DNA of the pathogen. So really, the more different ways we can look for it, the better our chances of being able to identify it. Sadly for the patients, these labs are, are all out of pocket. So if somebody really needs to get t testing done through insurance, you know, at least making sure that they're getting the Western blot, not just the ELISA, and then also testing for some of the co-infections is important. But if somebody comes back negative on one of those standard tests, I always say to them, you know, we can't really assume that this is then for sure a negative result. And you were talking about testing band. What, what, what does that mean? What, what is a band? So it's just the way the Western blot is reported. And these bands are different numbers. Um, and, I mean, it, it's not so important, like, what well, all the numbers represent, like, different parts of the antigen. I, I don't want to get confusing about that. But the, the lab report will come back with these different numbers and next to the number, it will it will show if it's a positive or a negative. So they're just different markers within the Western blot that put together give us the, either the negative or the positive diagnosis. So they're like different protein markers that's part of the antigen or part of the kind of Lyme, so to say, that the immune system will react to. Correct, yeah. I mean, they're, they're basically measuring one's immune response to the different parts of this of the Lyme bacteria. Okay. And uh, you, you're mentioning also, so lab is, 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 a, is a component that you back up your, your clinical evaluation of, of the patient, uh, you know, symptom manifestation, obviously history. So what, what kind of symptoms would you, uh, would a patient need to present in order to be able for you to suspect possibly Lyme? So the, the symptoms of Lyme are sort of many and varied. And so some of them are quite general, like I have fatigue, I have headaches, you know, but what I would typically see is, you know, fatigue, joint pain, muscle pain, muscle weakness. Um, often there's neurological involvement. So there can be, you know, even seizure-like activity, headaches, migraines, um, cognitive deficits, people reporting that, you know, they'll drive up the road and won't remember where they we're heading to, so they've got to turn around and go back home again. We're just, you know, word finding issues, problems with focus and concentration, um, all kinds of different things. Night sweats, temperature regulation, dizziness, um, blurry vision, ringing in the ears. They're, they're sort of more symptoms of that are a little bit more attached to one of the typical co-infections. But, you know, pretty much every symptom out there is possible in line. What I look for, because usually by the time people get to the Lyme testing and diagnosis, they've been to see 20 doctors already. They've been to the neurologist. They've been to the rheumatologist. They've been to the psychiatrist. They've been to, you know, all these different specialists. And I, you know, I think it's a bit of a sad reflection on our medical system today that specialists just look at their, their system. You know, they just evaluate their system. They're not looking at the whole person. And so what I often hear from my patients is, you know, either nothing came back on the testing, like my lab test, everyone says I'm sort of on paper, I'm healthy. Um, so part of that assessment clinically is they've usually been tested and evaluated for a bunch of other things that got ruled out along the way. And so then doctors sort of throw their hands in the air and say, look, I don't know what's wrong with you. There's theoretically nothing wrong with you. And you saw this, you know, you could just be depressed or just be anxious or whatever. But so that's a part of it. And then the other clue for me is just, you know, Lyme can cause the most bizarre 
combination of symptoms that just can't be explained any other way. Um, and so we look at some of these specific manifestations, like there's a co-infection called Bartonella, and it typically produces pain in the soles of the feet. Um, whereas, you know, Babesia does more of the night sweats and temperature regulation problems and shortness of breath. So it's just being able to recognize some of the nuances because a lot of the sim symptoms are so general and picking up some of the nuances of not only Lyme but the co-infections as well and just learning, you know, how they all tend to go together. Great. Well, I think we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to HealthMade Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Nicole and Nicola. We'll be right back. Welcome back to HealthMade Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Nicola. She's one of the internationally recognized leaders in the integrative field in how to treat Lyme. So you were talking about co-infections. I mean, we were Lyme, you know, first, how, how do you get Lyme? I mean, when you think of Lyme, you just think of ticks. Is, is that the only way to, to get Lyme? No. So that's sort of how it's typically, you know, thought of, and that's certainly one of the, the primary ways. But I have had patients that got Lyme from other kinds of bites, like mosquitoes, um, bird mites. Uh, there's been a you know a number of different reports where infections like that were clearly transmitted through other kinds of insects. Um, but Lyme also, it's possible that it's sexually transmitted. So I do have patients that have um, contracted Lyme from a partner, sexual partner, and Lyme can also be passed from mum to baby in utero. And that's really tough. So some kids are actually you know born with Lyme disease if their mom didn't know when they were pregnant that, that she was infected. And do you, just because you have, because uh, the Lyme bug, you, it's uh, it's Borrelia, it's a spirochete Borrelia. Uh, if you're, do you, do you have to have Lyme because you're uh, infected with, because you have the, uh, the spirochete or can you be infected and still be okay? Well, you can be infected and still be okay. And I know this because, you know, I have tested some partners of patients, spouses of patients, and sometimes they'll test positive but not have any symptoms. And I actually have a theory that there's probably a bajillion people walking out around out there with Borrelia in their system. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason I feel that is because I have lots of patients that will report that their health was okay. There may have been, you know, a couple of red flags or a couple of things just not quite right, but their health was generally okay until something happened in their life. So whether it be a surgery, a car accident, death of a loved one, like something traumatic. And that was then enough to suppress their immune system and the infection just sort of took over and then um, symptoms really spiraled from there. So I've heard that story so many times that I feel like they probably, you know, in that situation did have Lyme before. It's just their, their body was coping with it. Their immune system was coping with it until something happened that set their immune system sort of down and then the infection just really kind of took over. So, yeah, I do think there are a lot of people, there are people out there who have Borrelia in their system, in their body, but they're not actually symptomatic with it. Their immune system is just kind of taking care of it at that level. And uh, you're mentioning then the co-infection. So what what does that mean? Does it mean that uh, whatever, if you're bit by tick or mosquito or uh, that not only Borrelia gets into you, you have other infectious agents that comes as well? Yeah, exactly. So. When we say Lyme disease, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can define it. Textbook definition, to your point, was, yeah, an infection with Borrelia, um, or even stricter, an infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. We now know that there's other strains of Borrelia that cause problems. Um, but really, when we say Lyme disease, most of the time we mean Borrelia and its buddies, right? So it can run along with Babesia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, Rickettsia. I mean, there's several of these infections that could be transmitted through the same bite. So that's what we call the co-infections. And then there's some other things that we refer to more as opportunistic infection, things like Mycoplasma, um, even Candida. Um, we see some of these things frequently in Lyme patients. We just don't 
expect that they've been transmitted through the same bite in the same way that the co-infections have. So you can actually get the candida through the bite, because, uh, I mean, usually when you think of candida, you think of somebody who's been on antibiotic or eat a lot of sugar, uh, but you can actually then be infected through the bite and have it get into the bloodstream that way. No, sorry, let me clarify. So, um, so no, I'm not saying that candida comes through a bite. Um, I'm saying that once um, somebody is infected with Borrelia and some of the co-infections, then we frequently see candida getting out of ballots in their body. Because okay. candida is something that we all naturally have in our digestive system. It's proper for it to be there. It's just when the immune system is out of whack, then candida can become overgrown. So we especially see that in some of our folks on antibiotics. We especially see it with you know, high sugar diets, exactly. But I also have found that a lot of my Lyme patients have issues with candida whether or not they've been on antibiotics. Mm. So it's, it's kind of like the bucket effect that when you, you have layer upon layer of infections and you have a harder time to deal with others. So it's immune system. Exactly, then. yeah. It's just a total load on the body. And, and that's why we call it more opportunistic because it's really just taking advantage of the situation at hand. It's not necessarily part of the Lyme picture directly, but these infections that, you know, they may... They may be sitting dormant in a person's system as well, but you know, once the immune system is so challenged by these multiple growing infections and, and quite intense infections, then everything else goes pear-shaped. And what you're mentioning, I mean, when dealing with then Lyme disease, you the symptom picture can be quite vast. I, I know it's great. It's called a great mimicker. It can mimic pretty much any type of disease. Uh, but one of the things that you were mentioning, uh, and you even wrote a book about it, is called the Lyme brain. So how, how would you describe a, a Lyme brain and, and you know, what, what is it that makes it appear you know, when you have Lyme of all the different symptoms? Yeah. So Lyme brain is, a, is just sort of a term that's been adopted for a lot of the cognitive or, you know, not only the cognitive, but also the sort of psycho-emotional symptoms that arise with Lyme as well. So um, most people, when we say Lyme brain, we think of like the brain fog, just not being able to think clearly, not being able to focus or concentrate, you know, forgetting names of close friends. Like I said, driving up the street, forgetting where they were going, having to come back, word finding issues, just all of those sort of cognitive challenges are such a common part of the Lyme picture. Um, but then also there's, there's more of the psych symptoms too. So Lyme can create depression and create anxiety. And some of, in some cases can create like panic attacks and OCD kind of behavior. That's very typical with Bartonella as a co-infection. So there's a lot of impact that, um, that occurs on the brain and on the central nervous system. And so part of that is directly caused by infection in the nervous system, or it can be caused by that. But it could also just be infection in the body that's creating inflammation. And those chemicals that are kicked up with the inflammatory process can cross the blood-brain barrier and kind of make some fireworks in the, in the brain. So, I mean, it, it's part infection, it's part inflammation, and then, you know, I also think it's, it's usually part toxicity, too, because we tend to find that people with chronic Lyme um, are more prone to mold toxins and heavy metal toxins. And it's just, again, that total load. Their system just can't regulate the things that other people might be able to regulate. Yeah, I would imagine, just like we're talking about uh, candida uh, being opportunistic when the immune system is suppressed, that uh, candida then has an ability to flare up because the immune system is not able to check it. Uh, I would assume that also detoxification, if you use a lot of energy to fight the Lyme disease or Lyme you know, bugs, then you have a hard time. You, you don't have as much energy to detoxify. You're, you're also in that kind of sympathetic state, stress state, which is not, a, uh, which is not conducive for detoxification. Correct. And then, you know, there's all the genetic sort of predisposition to with methylation issues. And, and so, you know, part of, part of recovering from Lyme 
is reliant on one's ability to detoxify. And so when I work with someone, the first thing I do is work on their detox before we even start killing off bacteria or any pathogens, because if they can't detox, when we do start antimicrobial therapy, however that looks, whether it's herbs or antibiotics or ozone or whatever the case may be, they need to be able to clear the toxins that are released when we kill off the pathogens. And that's why we get this thing called a Herxheimer reaction when people feel worse before they feel better. Um, it's because their body is then sort of flooded with the toxins that are released from these pathogens. And so then they've got to deal with that too. And so, you know, if their detox pathways are challenged, that's going to make it harder for them to clear those toxins. They're not going to be able to tolerate treatment as well. They're going to feel really rough in the beginning. And sometimes when that's, you know, really profound, we've got to take treatment a lot more slowly because we've got to just kind of go with the pace of their body to be able to clear that. So then when, you know, when there's mold exposure, when there's heavy metals, these things all just snowball. And, um, and sometimes then, you know, the symptoms have so much overlap, it's hard to figure out what's what too. Like somebody comes back really high on mycotoxins or I just had a patient a couple of weeks ago come back with a mercury level of 130 or something when it should be like less than four. You know, it's, and, and it, so then it becomes a question of like, okay, so are her symptoms caused by the lime or is it the metals or is it mold? And so we're sort of chipping away at all these pieces at once. Yeah, but like you're saying then, it's even though, um, even though you may start on one end, you know, at least you're still decreasing the total load, so to say. Um, so we're gonna we can take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Nicola. She is the author of the Lime Brain, Lime Diet, and, and two other amazing books. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Nicola, and we are discussing something that more people are struggling with than we think, because we are not looking at the right location, and that is Lyme disease. Uh, so we're talking about the, the Lyme brain. You, you've explained that it could be caused by, you have that inf inflammatory response. You also have some, some of the toxins, your inability to detoxify. So an individual that then wants to treat the Lyme, and then they kind of look and see, you should take this herb and that herb you know, to kill the Lyme, they can sometimes do more harm if they don't start with, like you're saying, opening up the detox pathways first and making sure that your body is ready for detoxification. That's my opinion, yeah. I mean, I think sometimes when people are treated with more conventional um, therapies, like antibiotic therapy, um, if they do that without the detox support, in my opinion, they tend to fare worse and just not be able to handle it as well. So my view is there's definitely a place for antibiotics, and I do a lot of antibiotic therapy in my practice too. Um, however, if we don't support the body naturally, and it's not just you know herbs and supplements, it's things people do at home too. I mean, infrared sauna is great. Um, Epsom salt baths are great. Having lemon juice and water. Um, coffee enemas are the one thing that my patients report help them more than anything else. Um, ionic foot bath. So there's a, there's a number of different detox modalities as well as herbs and, and just, you know, again, we haven't even talked about diet, but I'm sure we will, but just minimizing the chemicals and toxins that come in through the diet um, can make a big difference too. So that's all things that people can kind of help with the management at home from what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's, in my view, really crucial. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, to, to support your ability to open up the pathways of elimination with the different tools that you mentioned are, are, are important. Uh, you did mention one of the common therapies that you would do medically. Let's say you go to a medical doctor and, and they say that, uh, yes, you have Lyme, uh, and they would then immediately put you on antibiotic therapy uh, what would be kind of a common way for, uh, I mean, what would be a common course for a, what you call the non-Lyme literate doctor? You know, how long of a course, what type of antibiotic, and why is that not effective? So 
uh, I'll try and just give a very brief overview of, of the politics, not that we want to sort of spend too much time on it, but just so for understanding. So the Infectious Disease Society of America has put out the treatment protocol, or the, the standard of care treatment guidelines for Lyme disease. Now, they don't even believe that chronic Lyme exists. Right, so that's fundamental to the conversation. They say it, all Lyme is treated with, you know, 14 to 21 days. Their maximum duration is 28 days in certain circumstances, but typically 14 to 21 days of a single antibiotic. Doxycycline, um, cefiroxim is another one that's in their treatment guidelines. IV rocephin if it's neurological. But they do say that after 14 to 21 days, all infection will be gone, and anything that continues past that is what they call post-Lyme syndrome, which if you read their gu guidelines is really kind of, I would interpret as like all in your head. Um, so that's kind of part of what we have to understand. So when we go to a regular allopathic doctor, Western medicine doctor who doesn't understand Lyme, their education is going to have been acute Lyme, 14 to 21 days, typically doxycycline, all good after that. Um, there's nothing else to do. Chronic Lyme doesn't exist. So that's why people aren't getting adequate treatment. Going to a Lyme literate doctor, I mean, we know that 14 to 21 days of antibiotics is a joke if someone's been sick for 15 years. Like, they're only, you know, that, that's enough to stir up a Herx reaction likely, but not nearly enough to put a dent in it. So, the truth of the matter is that antibiotic therapy for chronic Lyme is long-term courses of antibiotics and typically more than one antibiotic. Because the other thing that's weird about Lyme is it can change, the bacteria can morph into different forms. So I, I always explain it in very simple terms. It's like you've got a caterpillar, you've got a cocoon and you've got a butterfly. They're theoretically the same creature, but they look and act very different. And so it is with the Borrelia bacteria. They can be a spirochete, which is the spiral shaped. They can lose their cell wall. We call it a cell wall deficient form. Or they can roll up in a little ball and hide, which we call the cyst form. And different medications address the different forms. So often we have to put a protocol together that covers the three different forms. If we have co-infections, that's a different, you know, that's another thing to weave in. So. Some of these medication protocols can get fairly complex. So, uh, and, and when you're talking about the cyst form, how how effective is antibiotic like doxycycline on something like a cyst form? Uh, not at all. So, um, the one that I use the most for the cyst forms that the research has shown pretty good things on is tinidazole, which acts officially is an antiparasite medication. And we do it in pulses, so like two or three days a week. It's not every day. But that is one that has been proven to be effective. There are some other medication combinations that are being used. There's one that's like doxycycline, daxone, daptomycin, and, and third one I can't remember right now. But, um, but some of those medications have massive side effect profiles. So I have found that tinidazole is probably the best option for the cyst form. Plaquenil is sometimes used, Alinea is sometimes used, but um, but yeah, so a standard antibiotic like Doxy isn't going to do that. So when a patient comes to me and they've been put on a single antibiotic like doxycycline, especially if it's for a prolonged period of time, the first thing I worry about is that those bugs probably just kind of went into cyst form because they wanted to hide and so the person feels better for a period of time, but as soon as they go off the antibiotics, those cyst forms can convert back to spirochetes and cell wall deficient forms. So it's like, ta-da, gotcha. <laughs> and, and when they're in their cell wall deficient forms, I mean, what, what is the benefit for the, the bug at that time to be in, in that state? And what does it do to the body? The cell wall deficient forms tend to... Um, I always consider them sort of getting deeper into the body and, and causing more of those really ingrained chronic kinds of symptoms. Um, but it's really just the, the bacteria trying to escape, I mean, trying to evade the immune system, trying to, it's like adapting to survive really is what's, is what's going on. 
And Borelli is very good at that. It's frighteningly good at that. And uh, also we have something that's called biofilm. How, how does that play in into uh, fighting Lyme disease? Yeah, so biofilm is um, like a sticky goo. It's officially a mucopolysaccharide matrix, but I call it sticky goo. And it is a substance that these bacteria can um, create, and it gives them a sort of safe environment to live in. So... If you think of it like, you know, they're living in slime, basically, and that's another way that they hide, and they can form, like, little communication networks in there. They can reproduce in there, but it just, again, gives them that layer of protection from the immune system, and Borrelia is not the only pathogen that creates biofilm. Um, Candida creates biofilm as well. We have different biofilms in our mouth, Um, so it's it's not unique in that way. But it is something to consider because if the bacteria, the pathogens are hiding in the biofilm and somebody's not getting that biofilm broken down, which we typically do through like certain enzymes, for example, then their treatment response is going to be limited as well. Great. Well, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Nicola. She's the author of Lyme Brain, Lyme Diet, and and a, a couple of other wonderful books. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Dr. Nicola. So we're talking about the, the different forms of Lyme. Uh, how about, you know, you, you have the, the antibiotics. We discussed them a little bit. But there are also then herbal uh, substances that you can use that have, have shown to be very effective. What, what are some of your favorite ones that, that you use in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. I do have a, a, a top key sort of list of favorites. So, yeah, I mean, herbal medicines can be very effective. And, and don't get me wrong, it, you know, it's not every patient that does long-term antibiotics. And I'm not saying that that's the only way it can be done, not at all. Um, but, yeah, so some of the herbs I use the most, I use a lot of Smilax or um, Smilax Glabry specifically because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And it's good for kind of more of the detox part and helping manage the inflammation. Um, I use a lot of cat's claw. Uh, I actually use a herb called guaiacum. It's not as well known here in the U.S., but it's used a lot in Europe. And it was used in syphilis treatment because syphilis was, is a spirochete as well. Um, so it fits that it would be effective for Borrelia. Um, teasel root, cat's claw, guaiacum, olive leaf, um, and... Then for like more for Bartonella, I use a lot of Hetunia, uh, Cryptolepis, and that helps for Babesia too. Babesia is a protozoa. It's a parasite that lives in the red blood cells. So when we're looking at treating Babesia, we're looking at more of the sort of anti-parasitic effect. Um, so I use a lot of artemisinin um, and sort of more, you know, clove, wormwood, those kinds of you know, quassia, those kinds of antiparasitic herbs. But there are some great antimicrobial herbs. And so I use those a lot. Um, and sometimes it's just, you know, it's easier for the body to handle. You don't have to worry about side effects as much with herbs as with antibiotics. Um, but people can still have their Herxheimer reactions when herbs can create that just as much as, um, as antibiotics. And then we use a lot of grapefruit seed extract too, which is kind of like our natural cyst buster. Um, in the test tube anyway, in the, in the Petri dish, it, it was effective. We don't have human studies, but grapefruit seed is a, extract is a great antifungal as well. So it, there's usually benefit to adding that in. And when, when a patient comes to you with, with Lyme, I mean, how, how long can they expect that they need to treat the Lyme and, and it, before they start to get better? I mean, what, what's kind of a common time frame that you see? Yeah, so I usually tell people the first month is probably going to be horrible. Um, but And we have to just sort of graduate their treatment according to how they respond in those first few weeks. I'm not one to have people really push through terrible big herxes. There are some doctors that are like, hey, you just got to sort of suck this up and keep on going. But if someone's having really big, strong Herx reactions, I always slow down their treatment. So it depends. You know, generally speaking, I used to tell people, you know, expect a year or so. 
I mean, now I almost tell them expect two years because I'd rather them be sort of pleasantly surprised than than the other way around. But I mean, it's never less than a year unless they've only been sick for a couple of months and, you know, maybe they knew they had a bite two or three months ago. They didn't quite get it in that acute phase. Um, but it's not, you know, that's a very different picture to someone who's been unwell for 15 to 20 years. Yeah, so it, it's important for people to understand that this is something that you don't just get rid of in you know, a couple of months or you know, take a few supplements and all of a sudden it's gone. It, it's, a, it, it's a focused, comprehensive therapy that, that you need to have somebody that's very well-versed in this area to, to guide them through. Yeah, and I would say too, I mean, I always, I feel, I have mixed feelings about this, but you know, a lot of people end up going into Facebook groups and, and you know, Googling things and looking things up and there's a lot, it's great for people to go get support, but what really concerns me is, you know, there's a lot of Lyme patients sort of telling other Lyme patients what they should take or giving them, you know, recommendations and Obviously, if, if something worked for an individual, other people are going to be interested to know what worked because Lyme treatment is tough. You know, it's difficult. and what, There's no one thing that works for everybody. Um, so it needs to be really individualized, and every body is different. Every situation is different. So, you know, it's hard because most Lyme docs don't take insurance. It's not, um, it's not an illness that fits well in the insurance model because there's just no way that you can catch somebody up on you know what's going on for them and treatment plan in seven minutes it just it's just you know not possible um but also there's some liabilities like i said because lyme is a highly politicized climate so it's hard for patients treatment is expensive a lot of times i understand that fully but by the same token you know it scares me to see some people just kind of winging it based on what other people, other patients have been sharing, you know, on social media or whatever. Yeah, I, I think we still come from that medical model where we think this disease, this pill, you know, where we're thinking we have this disease and then we take that pill, not recognizing that we, like like you are, you got to look at the whole picture and there's so many different factors that play into that. So each individual each picture is going to look, be very unique, and then you need somebody that's able to guide them through that and shift gear when it's needed and halt the process or speed up a process when, when that is needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so important because people can end up, you know, they can end up a lot worse if they don't, if they don't do it right. And you also wrote a whole book about the Lyme diet. I'm really curious about that. What what does the Lyme diet look like? Yeah. So I, it was funny. I wrote a book. I sat down at my mum's kitchen table one time in Australia to write a sort of two-page patient handout about diet because people would always ask me, and it just kind of kept going from there. And the book's been really popular. I've been really happy with, with how it's gone. People are interested and want to do the right thing nutrition-wise, just sometimes don't. And so... The Lyme diet, um, it's, you know, it's nothing revolutionary. I mean, my, my, my three big things, if I just summarize them, are no gluten, no sugar, and minimal dairy, if any dairy, because they tend to be the most inflammatory foods. They tend to, um, you know, trigger immune re responses, which we don't want. We want the immune system just kind of clear to, to work on the Lyme part. And sugar, of course, as you mentioned earlier, is one of the sort of predisposing factors for candida overgrowth, as well as being very immune suppressive. So the book talks about, um, it really goes into like, why are these things important for Lyme patients? You know, talking about how to eat to optimize adrenal health and how to eat to minimize inflammation. So while the, the book is sort of, you know, like eat, anti-inflammatory foods such as you know these healthy fats and and no gluten and dairy and, and sugar um what's more important to me is having people understand why those things are important and what they're doing to their body and i'm a big fan of igg food sensitivity testing so that we can individualize even more um, and just you know make sure we're not having people eat foods that are triggering immune responses that they don't know about so in, in, in essence, uh, obviously when you're going after Lyme uh, with a, a comprehensive protocol, you want to then reduce 
other stressors as much as possible. And obviously what we're putting into our mouth is uh, probably the, the, the biggest drug that we take, you know, because we take a lot of it every day. So to then minimize the stressor on the body, doing like an anti-inflammatory diet, and then pinpointing exactly what kind of foods that would trigger inflammation, uh, like you're saying, doing an IgG test to pinpoint if, you know, maybe tomato is creating the inflammation or maybe avocado, things that you would think would be absolutely benign. And it can actually then suppress the immune system and then put you so that it's harder for you to fight the line. Exactly. Exactly right. That's, that's exactly correct. And, and then you're, you're talking about supporting the adrenals, so it, it, it's, it sounds like then creating a terrain then for uh, the, creating a terrain where, it's, where the immune system is optimized, uh, the endocrine system is optimized, and uh, which makes it then harder for any kind of pathogen to thrive. Yes, it's not just about killing bacteria. That's the thing, especially, you know, maybe with an acute case that it, it, it is about killing bacteria. But once somebody, you know, is chronically ill, there are so many different elements and strengthening the system and strengthening the terrain and strengthening immunity is, is such a big part of that. It's not enough, in my opinion. You still have to do antimicrobial therapy, but you've got to be strengthening the foundation at the same time. And so, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of pieces to it. Um, and that's why, you know, I think... A sort of an integrative approach is so key but just going back to the diet for a bit I mean there's so many elements of Lyme that have people feeling very you know disempowered a lot of people have a lot of PTSD to be quite honest about what's happened over the course of their history they've been ridiculed they've been sent out of doctor's offices they've been refused treatment they've been told they're crazy I mean some horrible horrible things and so I feel that nutrition is one piece that they can control they get to decide, you know, do they want to put inflammatory, high toxin level foods into their body or, or not? Or are they going to make the choices that will help support their healing? And it's one thing that they get to choose every single day. I mean, I'm over in my office. I'm not monitoring what they're eating. You know, that's something they've got to take responsibility for. But the majority of people, once they get their diet on track, they do feel a lot better. Wonderful. Yeah, it and and that is that is such a key is to to take back your own power and recognize that you are part of the healing process so that you don't feel like some somebody or something is just doing something to you but you uh, have that power to be part of the solution well dr nicola it, it was a, it was such a, an honor to have you on the show and i'm so grateful for that you're bringing so much healing and help to people that desperately need it. So thank you so much for, uh, for being on my show. You're very welcome. It was great to talk to you today. That is it for today. You're listening to Health Made Radio. Uh, remember, check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it.